but we try to source any game from uh, places where it's been, you know, reared and harvested in, in as sensitive a manner as humanly possible. Fish is a real big one for me because I regard fish as wild food. Um, I We're very careful about certain things. So, for example, in all of mine, I don't use farm salmon. Welcome to the Into the Wilderness podcast. I'm your host, Byron Pace. It is November the 9th, 2021. Our regular listeners will be aware of the slightly sporadic nature of the last few shows over the last couple of months, and that is only because we've been working really hard on some quite incredible episodes and some new series with some new partners that you're going to start seeing releasing in the coming weeks and into the early part of 2022. We really sort of kicked off the relaunch of the show last week with a fantastic episode, and this week is no exception. Uh, this show is being brought to you by Forlo in collaboration with an incredible article that was published in Volume 7 of Modern Huntsman. That article told the story of Pat Van Emmeren, who is a fisheries biologist, and his lifelong obsession, in a way, of protecting the native cutthroat trout of Montana. But it isn't just about fish. In that story, you also hear about him tranquilizing wolves and putting them on the back seat of his car for some relocation programs. Uh, a fascinating guy, a follower ambassador, just like, in fact, this week's guest, which is Mike Robinson. Now, Mike Robinson is a chef, an entrepreneur, a TV presenter. There seems to be no end to his list of talents. He lives in my home country of the UK, except he is south of the wall over in England. And today we really dive into deer management, actually, as a sort of a focal point of a lot of the discussion that we have and how that feeds into the food chain and how that feeds into his restaurants and what his kind of mindset and ethos is around conservation and sustainable sourcing of food. If you haven't already got your hands on a Volume 7 Modern Huntsman, you can pick that up on modernhuntsman.com now. And if you flick forward when you get that in your hands to page 199, you will find the article Wild and Pure, which is presented by Forlo, all about Pat Van Emmeren. And you'll not only be able to find more about him and his work, but also about the Forlo ethos and what the company is about. So with no further delay, I'm delighted to present Mike Robinson to the podcast. Mike, welcome to the Into the Wilderness podcast. It's hard to know where to start with you because you're a restaurateur, you're a deer manager, you're a TV host. What came first? Um, what came first? Um, uh, washing dishes in a restaurant about 30 <laughs> <Really>? years ago. Really? <laughs> really? So you, yeah, you started um, right at the ground floor? Oh, yeah, I still feel like I'm there, to be honest. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's it's an interesting business. You know, it's it's continually stressful there's constant challenges you're working it's a it's a total people business so you're working with people in the restaurants like all the time and thus there are you're constantly dealing with sort of um, both on one end of the scale people's amazingness and on the other hand total fallibility so <laughs> it's it's it, you're always in the situation where you think you're on top of it and you're never quite on. <laughs> So how did you get from, I mean, seriously though, how did you get from washing dishes to having very successful restaurants? Um, I, uh, how did I get in there? It, it, it was a simple story, really. I, I, I did a degree at university in forestry of all things because I always wanted to work on the land and uh, outdoors was my thing growing up. But um, when I, when I was, went to live and climb mountains and hang out in the Alps in France, I got a job washing dishes and I didn't speak any French, which I rapidly learned and uh, in the sink and got just kind of got seduced by the, there's a sort of vibe and a buzz in a busy restaurant that's it's incredibly seductive and exciting. And however, how many thousands of times you do services in a restaurant, it never goes away. It never gets dull. And, um, and I got a little. I got seduced by the food. I was looking at all this amazing food that was going out, and I found myself wanting to know how it was done. So I started uh, sort of helping do prep in the afternoons, and then a chef quit, and I got bumped up. 
And, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of cooked around the world. I, I cooked in Australia, um, New Zealand. I cooked, I cooked all over the place and for a year or two and then came back to Britain and, uh, yeah, you know, worked in restaurants, um, never like super famous restaurants, but it, when a, a leap forward a few years and I finally had the sort of guts to buy my own pub. Yeah, near where I'd grown up in Berkshire, um, I knew that I wanted to try to do something different and I wanted to try to use, I, didn't, I don't think anyone knew what the word sustainable meant back there, but, but um, I wanted to use wild food uh, that I could take you know, from the land without hurting it and use it in my menu. So in Britain, of course, we're lucky enough to be able to do that. So I, uh, I did that. And that worked. I did that. Opened another one in London, the Harwood Arms, which has done very well uh, and is still going. And um, and then I, I sort of partnered up with a with a group and have been the sort of um, advisor and opener and sort of creator of several more restaurants. And it's, um, yeah, it's an exciting journey. And what was it? Did you have a background like growing up in hunting and fishing and that sort of interacting with nature out there and and the wild world, as it were, in terms of food, or did that come come after? I'm trying to work out how that slotted into your this sort of long so, process of cooking. So um, I was totally feral growing up. I I did not have neither of my parents hunt or shot or fished at all. Um, they none of, none of my uncles, literally no one in the family. Um, there was something inside me that 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 was I don't know. I always had a yearning for adventure. I, I'm a voracious reader, so back then, pre-internet, um, you know, I would read books. I, I would read books when I was at school on on survival and, and techniques of trapping and hunting and 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 uh, you know, go out and try to catch rabbits and this, that, and the other. And when I got my first air gun we had a plague of rabbits in our field and I basically taught myself to hunt on rabbits. But my father was extremely strict that I couldn't, I couldn't kill anything unless it was to be eaten. So, you know, that literally the two things that I hunted were rabbits and squirrels and we ate a lot of rabbits and squirrels. And that was my first, the first thing I ever remember cooking aged about 12 was a rabbit korma, a, a mild rabbit curry. Okay. Wow. Okay. So you went, so, so you've gone from rabbit and squirrel curry to cooking food for people in many restaurants. So tell me about the, tell me about your most most recent restaurant because I think that's the one that I have seen or are aware of most. Yeah, the Forge in Chester. So this was a restaurant uh, in a new build, a new building, a new hotel, and uh, the guys who I worked with said, "Would you, would you?" try and see would you work your magic and create and it was a great challenge you know it's a beautiful town we uh so we uh yeah we 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 built it around fire and flame just like i like to use in the other ones and that that's kind of the thing i'm the angle i'm going for now is is that i like to cook naturally as well so i like to use wood charcoal and fire for cooking food in our restaurants more than just traditional internal kitchens and gas stoves you know well, that and adds a lot of character, it, doesn't it? When you're talking about wild yeah, food, uh, it does, and they it complements wild food. You know, it it just works really, really, really well. So that's that's another great big passion of mine, and very important to me. Um, and and you know the, the 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 real thing is everything fits together. So at the same time as these restaurants, um, I also have been building up uh, our. Man, wild deer management business because that's something that's you know, monumentally important to me is the future of wild deer in Britain and how they must be looked after but how they must be controlled and managed and that's uh, a big problem at the moment. Um, I, yeah, I definitely. Want, I want to talk more about the the wild deer issue, but just before we get to that, how explain to me the the sourcing process? But when you are sourcing so much wild food in your restaurants, mm. explain to me how you actually go about that. Because the venison we can do a deep dive on, but it's much more than just just venison. And there's obviously non meat produce as well. Absolutely. I mean, 
first thing we look at in all of them is the sustainability element. So uh, now that we truly understand what that word means, in other words, you know, where you can take a sort of biological surplus from the wild without harming the, the, the base stocks and the ideal level that that creature sits at within the, within the environment. Um, what we do is we look at deer, as you say, are relatively easy, but we also look at other things. We see um, game, as we know it in Britain, sits in a sort of grey area because a lot of it is is initially reared and then released into the wild. So there's a sort of halfway house there. It lives wild, but it often didn't start wild. But we try to source any game from uh, places where it's been, you know, reared and harvested in as sensitive a manner as humanly possible. Fish is a real big one for me because I regard fish as wild food. Um, I We're very careful about certain things. So, for example, in all of mine, I don't use farmed salmon. Like, yeah, I was about to period. ask you that. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I mean, it's a really good example. I've made a decision and I stand by it that, you know, I don't believe it's the way it is done now. Now, if that if that wild salmon was brought in from open cages in the locks into a closed inland facilities i would ha- i would look at it again and if i was happy that the feeding of those salmon wasn't impacting on sand eel stocks and things like that then i would look at it but the bottom line is i've seen the damage that open cage systems start do firsthand a lot and it's 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 armageddon for the for the marine environment you know it's uh it, it to me i just won't use it so it's a really important um, point that you make there though because it's being brave enough to know that things can change. And when things get better, then you're happy to, to re-look at things. And yes. the, the, the conversation that I've always had about um, farm salmon, and I will not buy and haven't bought farm salmon for many, many yeah. years. And I will re- pretty much refuse, well, I will refuse to eat it. <laughs> but my point is not so much, and there, there is an, an issue about welfare on top of that. But if somebody can say to me, Look, the welfare of these fish is brilliant and it's not affecting the wild environment. I will eat it again. But at the moment, yep. there isn't a system that actually can tell me that. 100%. There's a lot of spin and PR, but, you know, there's far too, there's, you know, all of us who are passionate salmon fishermen or whatever can see the degradation over the, over the last few years, you know. Um, there's too much of a correlation. I, I fished for. Uh, I went fishing for sea trout on the very on Loch Marie uh, last year up in the in West Ross. Wow! Yeah, and Loch Marie is amazing, and uh, we caught some brown trout. But Loch Marie, for, as a good example, used to be the greatest sea trout fishery in the British Isles. It was amazing, and the open cage farms arrived in the in the sea lock, and within within a couple of years, the sea trout stocks had collapsed. Sea trout are so desperately sustainable susceptible to sea lice and other issues that uh it just it just it just trashed it you know <laughs> it's <laughs> a really sad sad story that because i i've I've, done, I've told a few people this recently like i grew up reading tc kingsmill and hugh Falkus, hmm. and they they spoke so eloquently and so beautifully about Loch Marie. it was one of the great mm. greatest fish sea trout fisheries in the world and i always thought exactly. to myself one day when i'm big and i can and I've got my own car, I will, because this is like, I'm a kid, I'm like 11 years old, I'll drive and mm. I'll go and stay in the Loch Marie Hotel, the famous Loch Marie Hotel, and mm. I'll dap for sea trout. And by the time I was old enough to do that, the sea loch, uh, the, well, the, sorry, the Loch Marie, which has a, uh, runs into a sea loch, was dead. Like, there was no fish left. And I, years later, um, I got asked by the Salmon Trout Conservation um, Trust to go and make a film about Loch Marie, uh, which we did mm. about five years ago to raise the awareness of the issues there. And actually, that is one example where pressure and the right amount of work and, and hard work from individuals and organizations has shut those salmon farms down, I think, last year. Mm. And I was, hopefully, I mean, there must be some sea trout still running to Loch Marie. So hopefully, um, you know, in 10 years' time, we might see... A little bit of its former glory back. Yeah, um, it's uh, it it is an incredible place, and uh, not not great for midges, Byron. 
<laughs> well, I mean, all of the West Coast of Scotland is like that. Um, but Marie's particularly savage. I mean, the local cafe is called the Midge Bite. <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Yeah. So what about other fish stocks? Because I, particularly with recent documentaries and stuff, so I imagine that yeah. you uh, serve sea fish in your restaurants as well. So how do you go about being careful about how you source those? So we, we, we still have in uh, particularly Cornwall and the waters around Cornwall, we still have a, a very sustainable fishery down there, if it's particularly within our coastal waters. And we, we only buy from one supplier down in Cornwall, a company called Flying Fish, who are, I, I visit their factory fairly regularly. They are, uh, they only buy their fish from day boats. Um, I think the, the thing about offshore fishing is that the catastrophe occurs with the, the, the mega boats, you know, these huge trawlers yeah. that are, that are frankly just devastating swathes of the ocean that unrecoverably. And, 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 and yet you see the little 25, 30 foot fishing boat get pottering out of Mevagissi or, or one of these harbors. You know, they take a modest amount of fish every day. They care for the fish that they catch a lot. So they're in very good condition and they get a good price for it as a result. So we, we put fish on our menu. It's, it's expensive. I mean, okay. you know, you, you, if you want to, if you want to commit to buying from, from these sources, then you, you commit to paying a lot of money and thus you have to charge a lot of money. So fish is a luxury now, I'm afraid. Um, it has to be. It's too precious. Um, interestingly, I mean, as a personal thing, I've started now, I've started now getting very much into spearfishing as a, as a personal That's sort a of great occupation. Sport. And yeah. it, it's, it's incredible because for me, it's, it's sea deer stalking, it's foraging underwater. And you know, the problem with all things marine is the public never get to see what happens underwater. You don't see the numbers. I, uh, I had an amazing two weekends ago. I was in, um, well, last weekend, actually, I was down in South Devon and I, and, and Cornwall, we went out of Plymouth and we went 10 miles out to the Ediston Lighthouse and, um, which is an amazing place. And, you know, there, this time of year, every now and then you get a, you get some nice shoals of sea bass come in, as you do all over the coast. But it was really heartening to see a very large shoal of bass, and only for a few seconds. But, you know, we, we two of us got one fish each, and it was so, I don't know, it's hard to describe. You know, on the way back, I picked up a big brown crab that was lovely and big. You get to see the state of the underwater, and you get to, you get to be at one, and you, I think it makes you – unbelievably conservation minded you know yeah um it, it's hard to care for assuming. what you can't see it, it is and that's why that's why the public ignore farm salmon because um can't see them <laughs> you know so yeah i think i think marine marine and, and riverine environments are uh, 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 just need so much more care and love they really do they need the public to understand how critical they are to us have you got any uh, unusual meats on your menu, uh, un unusual protein? I don't think we do. I, I mean, I, I always say with our menus, venison is a very uh, interesting uh, – venison, for example, you know, it, the reason it's on there is that it's very, very available. And yeah. we don't – I don't put things like squirrel on the menu. I'd, rabbit, yes. Uh, you know, um, very occasionally we might put a hair, a hair or two on a menu if – if we've got a farmer that we know who's got surplus and wants, like I've got one farmer who has overwhelmed, but he loves hairs. So he takes about 10 or 12 a year and, and we get them. And, and for a week we have a hair ragu on a menu. You know, oh, what a privilege. Like that. Yeah. And that's a privilege, but you know, we, we think really hard about what we put on our menus. I, I, in the past I've sold English partridges when they're available. I'm, I'm just kind of now deciding not to, um, even though I love them, um, you know, I, I we stick with French partridges. We, we, I, I've dabbled with various things. I'd like to put things like pike on the menu or, oh, yeah, you know, I love pike actually. I, I love pike. I made a program about it two weeks ago. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an incredibly, I made, I smoked some pike fillets and made kedgeri on the riverbank with smoked oh, pike. And it, was, it was very tasty. And again, if you take the right pike, you know, yeah, not I'm from taking, a muddy hole somewhere. <laughs> no, but also not a big female. You know, take yeah. a it, it, take a six, seven, eight pound jack or slightly bigger male pike, and and you're not you're not doing any harm. Um, 
you know, I also question, like, you know, the, the, on the, the the different countries' habits. So you look at the continent, and you know, things like perch are hugely regarded. Yeah, Zander, I love hugely perch regarded. as well. Yeah. Oh, freshwater bass, but you know, we because we have such a strong coarse fishing culture, we don't do it. And I'm 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 not really a coarse fisherman. I I do like being able to commune with it, and I'm a fisherman more than an angler, so I like to be able to. You know, take a fish if it's if it if it's sustainable and acceptable to do so because I want it. I want to commune. I want to eat it. You know. Yeah. But um, you know, if I'm but if I'm salmon fishing in Scotland, I won't kill a fish. That 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 by the way requires me to catch one in the first place. <laughs> that can be a task in itself for sure. Um, when you're talking about uh, so you you mentioned this kind of crossover between wild and reared and that but with that we're talking about uh, pheasant and we're yeah. talking about french partridges is there um what's what's your view or your position now that everybody is talking about lead and non lead with that in your restaurants um i we have said for some years actually and with deerbox our deer management business uh, 2 years ago we switched over to non lead um okay. we made a very clear decision that that's what we wanted to do. Now, you know, my experience, and I can only talk personally about this, my experience is that, you know, non-lead, uh, our deer recovery rates have not changed. They're nearly 100%. You know, we, we find that non-lead bullets used accurately do the job just as well as lead bullets. Um, it does, however, mean that you can guarantee a customer that there are no fragments of lead in the food, in the meat you're serving them. Yeah. And okay. um, with game birds, I think that, uh, you know, the, the pellets that are flying at game birds, there is a scientific difference. Pellets are flying much, much slower. They don't fragment like um, like lead from a rifle bullet. Um, you know, they're going at a sort of a third of the speed. Um, so, you know, we still put caution. We still put on menus that, that game birds may contain lead shot because currently that's the way they are. I think that, uh, you know, when and if the country moves to steel shot, which, I mean, I think it probably is, um, then we will still say caution may contain steel shot. Yeah. Because you worry about people's teeth. People breaking their teeth, yeah. 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 (laughs) And I think that'll be a whole new issue with steel shot because, you know, if you bite into a lead pellet, you can, your tooth will survive it, but bite into a steel shot and you probably won't. Yeah, I um, yeah, it's a good point. Actually, it's a good point. From a restaurateur's <laughs> point of view, I think about these things. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm just I wanted to start talking about deer in a second, but it would be hard for me to talk uh, to somebody who serves wild game and not talk about uh, that that great excitement that you get around the 12th of August when there's the opportunity to put grouse on the menu <laughs> yeah. again. What's that? Yeah. What's that like for you? How do you get grouse to the plates of people literally hours after they've been shot on the 12th, which I assume you do. I don't actually. Oh, you don't? Um, oh, I was totally wrong no. then. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I don't really like it. Um, you don't like I grouse? Think all... Yes, I love grouse. Oh. I don't like. I don't like taking it off for more, roaring down the motorway, or putting it in a helicopter <clears throat> just to get it on a restaurant That's on a given fair. night. That's fair. That's I, fair. I, uh, I I put grouse on the menus around the fifteenth or sixteenth when they've had time to cool down be properly processed, be nicely packed. And then when they're at their best, I'd put them on our menu. (laughs) That's exactly the response that I would imagine that you would have, Mike. (laughs) But it it is a thing, isn't it? I mean, the reason I asked that question is that there is this great hype of getting getting grouse to the the plate on the 12th. There is. We've done it. We've done it. We did it at the Harwood a few years ago. And uh, it was very stressful. I think the grouse got to the restaurant at about 6.15 in the evening. And uh, having been sort of roughly plucked on the moor with a machine, you know, at their larder. And um, our guests were in the restaurant already when they arrived. And we we put a caveat. We told them uh, <clears throat> your main course could be served a little later, depending on <laughs> when they arrive. But <clears throat> but this is why I'm not really a fan of of it. I I love grouse. I like it very fresh. This is, by the way, personal because I have customers who like it quite strong. But I like grouse very fresh. Um, but fresh doesn't mean hot straight off the moor. I'd like it 
I'd like it to have had its time to cool properly in a chiller sure. for 24 hours. Then I'd like it to have been properly plucked, the skin have time to dry out, and then we'll get it on the menu. You know, And that process really with a game bird, for me, should take 72 hours to five days, that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. Now, I, I'm going to ask you, the, the, I promise this will probably be the only cooking uh, mm-hmm. recommendations I'm going to ask you, but I really do enjoy uh, eating grouse. Um, but I definitely am not particularly skilled in cooking it for myself or for other people. But so, I, and it's 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 such a it's such a privilege to have it in your hands and to be able to cook with it. It feels a shame not to do it justice. So, do you have a? Is there a a, a quick recipe that you can tell me, or a, a process that you can tell me and share with the listeners for cooking grouse, so that I don't end up ruining it? So the the the, the secret, honestly, to to cooking a a bird like grouse for me. Is it almost all the small game birds? We use the technique that the French call poche roti or poach and roast, and particularly with a grouse, whereby the innards are quite nasty tasting. In a grouse, they're quite sort of almost a little acidic. And uh, any animal that lives on heather has a very, very individual flavour. Heather imparts that flavour, and seeing as grouse lives on heather, that's you know, yeah, that that's that just the way that is. So. Poach and roast is, a, is really simple and really, really delicious. You, you essentially pluck your grouse, you, you draw it, and then you wipe it out. And what we tend to do with them is if we're then going to store them, we store them for several, we store them with a bundle of rosemary up their bum to sort of put some fragrance through. Them. But what we'll do is we'll get a, we, we take a, uh, a pan of chicken stock. We use nice sweet flavored chicken stock, just Stuff you buy in Sainsbury's, you know, in in like a plastic bag. Or you can make it yourself, but not from a pre-roasted chicken, a, a, a fresh chicken stock. Okay. And you put a pan of that on the stove. You can add water to it, but you put a pan of that on the stove. And uh, what you do is you bring it up to just below simmering, and then I throw a handful of rosemary in there, some salt, some peppercorns. And then I drop my plucked and drawn grouse into that. And it's not boiling. It's not even simmering. It's below that. If I was in the restaurant, we'd use a temperature controlled water bath and we'd have that at about 70, 75 degrees centigrade. So we pop it in there and we leave it for about seven minutes, something like that. Having, having opened the legs up a little bit, you know, cut the membranes between the leg and the body to allow the heat in. And what that does is it, the chicken stock cleans out the inside of the grouse and any nastiness comes out into the stock. It, it also gently warms the meat through uh, whilst keeping it very, very juicy. You take them out, you pat them dry, then you get a nice big pan and uh, with loads of knobs of butter, garlic, and rosemary, and you brown the grouse off in a pan after it's been poached. And then you put it in a 170-degree oven for another six or seven minutes uh, to finish it off, and it'll go golden brown. And what happens is you will – what you'll have is it'll be completely pink all the way through, but it'll also be completely cooked. So you won't have that jelly, bloody thing that oh, yeah. you get sometimes. It's happened to me. <laughs> yeah. and, and that is awful in my book. I hate yeah. it. So, so poach, poach and roast, six minutes in the stock, you know, minute or two of searing, six or seven minutes in the oven, let it rest. It'll be the best ever. Okay, well, that's how I'm going to cook it next time I have the chance. Mm, works For well. Sure. Partridges. Up for pheasant, by the way, for a hen pheasant, fifteen minutes in the stock, brown it. Fifteen minutes in the oven, equally amazing. Okay, well, you've heard it here, people. That's how you. That's how you <laughs> need to cook next time you're trying. Now, if we shift our attention to deer, I think it would be yeah. useful for people listening because uh, we have a lot of uh, international listeners, um, as well as people yeah. who maybe don't necessarily hunt. Just to explain what you see as the kind of, if I was to give it a title, the deer issue in the uk because it has become quite a hot topic and they yes. but they are also an amazing asset in the countryside just to exist in it but also as a food source well i'm glad you said that because I, I always come from that angle uh, there is a perception of deer at governmental level very much so in scotland possibly a little less so in england but uh, whereby they're seen almost as as vermin you know and i i, I think that when they get to their right levels, they're actually a huge asset to the UK. Um, anyway, so 
the, the, the country has been, and I'm going to talk about England because, you know, I, I know you're in Scotland, but England is, is the country that I focus on. And England has different attitudes towards the English government is slightly different. It's attitude towards deer to the Scottish government. The Scottish government spends a lot of time thinking about deer. Um, English government doesn't spend any. So <laughs> it's fair to say. It is fair so, to say, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> Politics. Um, well, that's why I'm getting so involved in it. So I've been managing deer for 20 years. I started with a small piece of land of a few hundred acres that I got permission on. And my first pub, the pot kiln, I would harvest the roe deer. And I quickly figured out the sort of levels of population that were acceptable to the farmer, to the gamekeeper, and me. And that's what it boils down to. That's the magic balance. So I then go to that grow and grow, and I end up with I ended up with about hmm, four estates, <laughs> totaling about 25,000 acres, harvesting four or 500 deer a year. And uh, th- those deer I would then put through a game dealer to process them, get them to my restaurants, and then sell a few to other restaurants, et cetera, but on a very small scale. When, um, when I set up this new group of restaurants, I thought, well, I want to be more formal about this, so I, I created a... I, I took on the rights to a very large estate in the Cotswolds. I, as part of that, I agreed that I would take on a full-time deer manager at my expense, and I would create a proper larder that is that is fully food standards agency accredited and authorised. And that's quite a thing to do. Trust Big me, task. Is, the bureaucracy is eye-watering. Yeah. So, particularly for eight deer a week. <laughs> so, but we did it, and it worked. Um, it didn't make any money, but that wasn't really the purpose of it. It, it. it had to wash its face, but it had to provide my restaurants with amazing provenance, wild venison, and manage the land correctly. And those are the two goals. So um, roll on to the, the pandemic. And uh, I found myself on, I think it was the 12th of March, 2020, with at the height of culling with 30-odd fallow deer hung up in my deer larder. And overnight, no restaurants were allowed to open to take them. <laughs> so, but the deer still need new, managed. I, well, but they they stopped being managed because overnight the game dealers couldn't buy them because they couldn't sell them. And this is the thing: it's market forces. Yes, the deer needed to be managed. No, they were not because everyone who harvested deer, no one really gets paid to do it in in England. Um. You know, it is reliant on market forces and the market disappeared. Then the double whammy of Brexit hit. And I think that probably 60% of our deer got exported to Germany, France, Belgium, etc. before the pandemic. And, uh, and that, that's effectively stopped and doesn't, is not showing any signs of reopening. Now, when you combine that with Germany, for example, Germany is putting a great deal more pressure on its own indigenous stocks of deer, boar, etc., and and it's being really quite hard on them. And as a result, there's a lot of indigenous meat available to what was quite a strong market for British deer. So every level, the the the, the market for British venison has, has been under attack. <clears throat> so I I I solved the problem short term in the pandemic by setting up an immediate online uh, box scheme to the public. And Smart. I got a couple of my chefs from the restaurants down and we we butchered like crazy and we packed and we we backpacked we labeled we we sent out to uh, put posts on instagram sold and sold all the deer that we every deer we needed to cull we culled and we sold them all and it was so much work <laughs> and um it was it was it really was but roll on to a little bit longer and my business partner in deer box ben heath and i came to me and said look i want to really run with this now that pandemic is sort of slowing down restaurants are reopening and i said well i really want to make sure that the public and the restaurant world i, I want to try and do something personally i want to try and do something to re-establish a market for deer because what i don't want to happen is for governmental controls to come in night shooting out of season licenses and the poor deer just get massacred and i because that's already happening happen. in places it's mainly north of the border yeah, um, yeah, so, yeah. At home here, yeah. I mean, I've seen all the new Scottish government uh, recommendations, and and they, they they, I find it 
horrible. You know, I've seen them. They've all been accepted to night shooting, to out of season. You know, the amount of young deer that are going to be left orphaned. You know, we have to we have to be sympathetic to the animal. You know, so what I've sort of not quite unilaterally, but I got in touch with Tim Woodward from the Country Food Trust, who oh, are yeah. an amazing organisation. And I, Tim and I are launching next month a an initiative that we're calling the Wild Venison Project. And it was my experiences with Deerbox that's, that's really led me to do this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to write to, I'm going to do an open letter to as many chefs as I can reach in the UK. And we're starting with the hospitality industry. And we're saying, please, 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 here are the problem. Here's the problem. Here is the environmental issue with an overpopulation of deer. Here is what we would, you know, what we need is a market. You are the market. We're not asking for restaurants to do any favors because actually it's highly profitable to sell and it's incredibly popular on menus. People love it. So what I'm trying to do is quite simply put chefs in touch with people who process deer and allow them to find the market so that they can access it. And what this will do, if we could treble the amount of deer sold in UK restaurants in a year, is it would put the price of venison up. It would uh, encourage those stalkers who currently might, you know, when the doe season hits this year, I wouldn't be surprised to see prices go back down to 50p a kilo again. Yeah. Um, Now, the double whammy of this is that we lost in terms of culling I, I, I cannot give numbers because there are no stats in Britain, but I know that we were already were probably 10% below every year what the population was you know, outbreeding us of wild deer in England in terms of what we we're culling. It's been growing consistently, and that's constantly in the news. What happened during the pandemic has meant that without a shadow of a doubt, we lost the whole of a March, which is a key month when all the restaurants shut and the, all the uh, game dealers basically for that month said, oh, can't buy any more deer. So they didn't get culled. Of course, some did. And people are so entrepreneurial and that's awesome. And some, a lot of deer were sold, cut up and sold locally to friends and things like that, but not in the numbers that were required to keep the cull up. Then November came around and all the restaurants shut again. And then January came around and Brexit kicked in. And and that sort of treble whammy means all the people I've spoken to, the Deer Initiative, the, the guys who used to run the Deer Initiative, the British Deer Society, or all, all, all the, uh, the leaders of that, we all concur, and the game dealers, by the way, spoken to a lot of game dealers. And the thought is that in England, the buying of deer went down over that period of time by optimistically 50%. Now, that means QED with that there is going to be a dramatic single year rise in the numbers of wild deer in England. And yeah, undoubtedly. That, that that has to be mathematically in the in 30 to 40%. Um so I've started this for, to try to get more people eating it. We do our bit with deer box. We we've just invested a vast amount of money building a new 4000 square foot state of the art processing facility so that we can hopefully process Two to 3,000 deer in our area this year. Um, but we are, you know, that's a drop in the ocean. What we need are the restaurants to get behind selling wild venison. That's what we need. And, uh, and that will, that, that will, and then at the same time, the Country Food Trust allows it, which is this stunning organization and charity that takes surplus wild meat. And turns it into incredible healthy food for the needy. Yeah, it's really it good. It's so good, Byron. It's the best yeah. project. Um, that I'm now a patron of that, and I'm the the idea of this project is that we're asking any of the retailers that come on board with uh, the Wild Venison Project, in return for access to new markets, we're asking them a point of sale to add on to voluntarily give the customer the option to add on a small amount to go towards the cost of processing for the uh, country food trust. That's a great idea. Great idea. Um, I mean, outside of, because the, the restaurants, when you, when you sit down and you're paying for somebody to cook for you, that's yeah. one thing. But what about actually getting, and I know that there have been different organizations in the past trying to do this, but getting or encouraging people to cook venison in their homes. It's, it's, it's a huge thing. And um, 
we've seen this predominantly our the deer box has been a, a business that has sold boxes of deer to the public and we are seeing an uptake we're seeing it constantly That's great. i mean what we need what we need now is to get some sort of national exposure for it as a meat i don't care if people buy it from me buy it from any one of the 30 or 40 amazing producers of venison in this country or however many there are but as long as people buy it from somewhere and as long as those processes are upholding the standards then we have a consistent uh then we have a consistent you know a consistent sort of level and people have good experiences with venison that's really important thing here that is important because uh, there is some uh venison that's cooked terribly <laughs> that I it's, in the past. it's almost always but like anything how the, right yeah yeah it's how it's treated it's it's all about how the beast is treated from the minute it is harvested. It's about temperature control. It's about timing. It's about time from when it's shot to when it's in the larder, how it's treated there. You know, all, these are huge factors, massive. Are you, uh, if you, if you were forced to pick, are you a venison over beef man? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we, so am we I. Live on yeah. it. We, I have to say, I think it's time in the conversation to start referring to it deer by deer. I mean, I'm a fallow deer. Lover. Yeah, this is a great <laughs> point, actually, Mike. And, like, and, and just elaborate on that, if you can, for a minute, because I'm, I'm a seeker. I'm, if I was to pick, it would be seeker, although predominantly I eat roe because that's most of what I shoot. But sure. uh, there is a difference, right? Venison is not just venison, but we brush it all with the same brush. There's an enormous difference. Absolutely colossal. The um, the the difference is massive. Um, the um, The... There are six species in the wild, and they are all completely chalk and cheese. Um, so in, a, in our restaurants, in, di- in, in our deer business, we don't refer to it as venison generally. We refer to it as fallow deer, oh, a brilliant. haunch of fallow deer, uh, a, a, a T-bone of a seeker, uh, whatever. And you know, I, I have to say, for me, the, the sort of the universal deer is the fallow deer. Uh, it's sweet, easy to deal with. It's not strongly flavored. It's it's the deer to serve a customer who hasn't had deer. Um, then there's the connoisseur's deer. There's the seeker, which is amazing. Uh, however, hard to get. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, I'm hunting get... some in a couple of days' time, so I'm really looking forward to that. Well, good. I hope you get some because they are extraordinary. And then there's the roe deer, which is it's my it's, it's, this is personal preference. One of my least favorite to eat. Mm-hmm. Um, in its in its quick cook form, in its pink form, if that makes sense. The um, I, I I we we specialize in the slow cooked shoulders of roe. They're, they're unbelievable, but I like mild meat, and I find roe can be quite gamey. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then muntjac is another great popular favorite. We everyone loves a muntjac. It's delicious, sweet. Do you know, I don't think I've ever eaten muntjac. Oh, it's so I don't good. think so because we don't have any up here. And I, although I've seen them when I've been out, and I, you know, I've hunted Chinese water deer, I just I don't think I'm pretty sure I'm right in saying I don't think I've ever had the chance to eat one. So I'm going to have to rectify that. You must. I think the key here is is, is ask when you if you go on, if you if you're listening to this and you go to buy some venison, whoever you're buying it from, look at the different ones that look at the different animals they're selling, and and try some different ones. Try a piece of fallow. Try a piece of munch. Try a piece of seeker. You know, just shop around and see what you like because they are all different. That's great advice. Now, if we go from uh, the serious conversation of uh, of deer management to mm. – and I suppose it, it's pretty – it is tied because so much of what you've been talking about is – educating and providing this window to the to the public as to what is going on and you really do that through this other part of your career which is a tv presenter I mean, how did that come about do you know i started doing telly very early on i kind of did my my life in reverse I, having run a a sort of a, a food business in uh, in in bath in the west of england for a few years when i was about 20 when i was about 28 i i uh I decided I really wanted, before I sort of settled down any further, to go and spend a bit more time doing something adventurous. So I moved back out to the Alps and sold that business, moved out of the Alps, set up a little food business, cooking to sustain myself, like as a contract cook in sort of posh, posh private cooking, if you like, in, 
in posh houses. And uh, and I, I got sort of headhunted by a TV company who were making a program about cooking in the Alps and chalets and things like that. And that was, and to my astonishment, they asked me on the, on the basis of a sort of screen test, as it were, they asked me if I would present this TV series. And and that kicked off. And, and then I got lucky enough to, to, to be asked to make a show about the opening of my new restaurant, the Pog Hill, which I did. And that, that we, we brought wild game into that the first time I, I, I got it. I went out and was taught to shoot on camera. My first year with my mentor, a wonderful butcher and game dealer called Alan Hayward, who owned a company called Vickers game down in Berkshire. Oh yeah, I know. And he yeah. taught me to stalk. Yeah. So Alan taught me to stalk. And I was very lucky because he was, he is the most incredible deer manager. Like he's, he just, he was and the most terrifying shot you've ever seen. Like he's amazing. Um, so he taught me about processing. He taught me about the importance of lardering deer, all this. So I then uh, scroll on a bit. I, I did quite a lot of TV presenting. I did Countrywise for ITV. I did various programs. But then I'd started the pot kiln, my first pub, and TV was taking me away from it for so many days a year. I The business wouldn't have survived. So I made a really tough decision to give up television and focus on the restaurant. And I. So focused on the restaurant, and I then uh, and and then uh, some time ago, I got introduced to the head of the Outdoor Channel in the US, who asked me if I'd make a program for them. So I made this little program called Farming the Wild, set up my own production company, all about what we do and how we do it. And uh, tomorrow, I'm on my way to the states to film the fourth series of it. So it's moved wow. on and on. So it's obviously done very well. Yeah, and we've made another series off the back of it, which is coming out in December, called Wild Game Masterclasses, which is a pure, a pure cooking wild game TV show, and it's uh, all set in the woodsman in our restaurant in Stratford on Avon. And I go th- in each episode, I do a pick a species or a cut, and I do a complete meal recipe from start to finish with all the tips on how we cook in restaurants and things like that. That's amazing. So, and is, is, so if people want to see this, is it is almost all this uh, stuff on the Outdoor Channel? Farming the Wilds on MOTV and on Outdoor Channel. Okay. At the moment, the new series is out right now, series three, and Masterclasses comes out on the same platforms in um, in uh, uh, when's it coming out in December, and then next year I'm also doing the same programs but with fish. So I'm doing Wild Fish Masterclasses and Wild Fish. Uh, and fishing the wild the tv show tremendous so (laughs) you've obviously managed to make it work now i guess you have good managers in your restaurants if you can uh, now that you're going back around the world filming again yeah yeah and and to be honest with you the way you know my my restaurants in um in in the, the the restaurants i've set up over the last couple of years three years very much my role now is sort of um oversight and making sure that the making sure that they are uh that the chefs are cooking the right style and and making sure that you know that they they run um you know i i'm getting to the point in my life where i've spent 20 to 25 years in restaurants day in day out and now what i'd quite like to do is, is see the world a little spend a little bit of time uh you know having having another adventure again and and hence the next five weeks i'm i'm off to film series four of farming the wild i'm going to I'm starting in oregon uh, hunting blacktail deer, then I'm going to Texas, then I'm going to Florida, and look at a lot of invasive species in the US yep. and the problems they're causing and how how they can be used. I'm going to so I'm going there. Where else? I'm going to go to Montana for ten days, go and explore Montana. I'm going to and then to Colorado. So proper adventure, you know. Mike, what what a what an amazing life story! And you seem you're involved in so many really important things, both in the the outreach and educating people through film and media, and then a lot of behind the scenes elements, which are sound like if you manage to pull it off, are really going to make a difference, not just for the welfare of deer, but our ability to to manage the countryside and do it in a way that has respect respect for the species that we live with because as you um alluded to earlier i think that's definitely something that 
is sadly failing up here, particularly in Scotland, where where deer are seen as one thing and one thing only, and that is a problem, rather than yep. uh, rather than asset and rather than an architect of the landscape. And yes, they do need managed, but they can also exist here as well. And we can have deer and we can have trees and we can have people uh, farming and existing in a landscape with them. It's not one well, or the other. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I feel that in Scotland, sadly, they've become a, a political weapon as well. And uh, you know, they've definitely been sort of weaponized to, um, you know, to, to fulfill political agendas. If you ask anyone from around the world what things they think of, they think of castles, bagpipes, and and, and red deer. Stacks. Yeah, right. You know, and yeah. so it seems to me that there's a wholesale program to demonise the red deer, and it, it's a terrible, terrible shame. Mike, if people want to follow your adventures and what you're up to, where's the best place to to follow you? Well, um, my Instagram is uh, at Game Meet Mike. Game Meet Mike. And uh, or farming the wild, um, and uh, farmingthewild.com is our website. And I'd love to welcome people. I, I'll be I'll be regularly posting what I'm up to over the next five weeks. I regularly post about recipes, about dishes, about techniques on the from the restaurants. So yeah, I'd love to see more people coming on board and following along. Well, Mike, thank you so much for your time today. It's been an intriguing conversation. Uh, Best of luck over the next five weeks, and I look forward to catching up with you when you're home. Um, Absolutely. Take care, Brian. Lovely talking. Thank you very much for listening. If you would like to find out more about Forlow, head over to forlow.com. That's F-O-R-L-O-H.com to have a look at their full range of gear. And of course, head over to modernhuntsman.com to order volume seven or the entire catalog of back issues. 